I see you as we're all talking. Um, <clears throat> So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Open Mouth. We have an exciting development recently. Um, we have gone from being a reading series only, um, sort of in between awkward stage doing other programs to just fully embracing it and being a literary center. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. You can read along with me at the document that Gwen just posted in the chat. Um, so we're um, Open Mouth Literary Center, uh, a nonprofit literary organization organization based in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, we host a monthly poetry reading and workshop with visiting writers like our friend Eddie T who is here today. Um, and we also host an annual retreat, an annual festival, and we now have a residency for local writers and we're um, extending, uh, we're, we're creating extended classes, the so six week classes, which we'll start offering a little bit later this year. Um, and so our goal is to bring local poets and poetry lovers in contact with nationally touring poets and to create greater community uh, through writing. So at each of our readings, we have an opening round of 10 or so community readers who read one poem each in rapid succession. Um, unfortunately today, uh, we had a couple of people call in sick, so we won't, we'll have seven opening readers assuming John gets here. Um, John was actually here last January um, doing a really wonderful reading and music performance with our friend Brian Clifton, um, which was really cool. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so if you're interested in being an opening reader for us, we have a document where we're collecting interest um, for that, that Gwen is going to post in the chat and we'd love to get your name and we can just email you when we're looking for people. Um, you can get information about future events on our website um, where we'll also, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. So that website is openmouthreadings.com and Gwen will also put that in the chat. Um, and we post about our events on all the social medias, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, and we also pay all of our featured readers. So we're taking steps to increase accessibility permanently uh, by continuing to post reading and workshop content online and at our Patreon account. Um, and by providing captioning services and access copies uh, to workshops and readings or at workshops and readings and also ASL interpretation um, at both of those events. So you can read more about what we're doing to increase the accessibility of the literary landscape on our website. And you can also support this work by signing up to give to us on Patreon or we have a GoFundMe specifically raising funds for interpreter fees right now, um, which Gwen will post in the chat. If anybody is interested in even giving five bucks to that, we would be really grateful. Um, and Gwen's also gonna post our social media handles and things like that so you can find us online and keep up with all the things we're doing. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing, a little bit more detail about what we're doing to increase access to the literary landscape. Um, we're doing that both for this new online format and when we're able to have in-person readings and workshops again. We're um, providing captioning for our Zoom readings and workshops, and we're also providing the ASL interpretation, as we said, um, and collecting, collecting visual aid materials. You can find those in the chat. Gwen will post them um, when we start, and then also once or twice as we're going, so you won't lose it in the, in the chat. Um, and we've also done a course with an accessibility consultant to better understand and apply the principles of accessible design. Um, we're really excited about the potential for access that an online format opens up. Um, because of it, we're able to reach people who might not otherwise be able to make our events um, because of everything from distance to immune issues to physical access challenges. So even when we return to an in-person format, which we're not gonna do until um, we're safe from COVID-19, um, we're working to ensure that we only work with accessible spaces. And we're also um, working on figuring out how to cast all of our in-person readings and workshops simultaneously online. Um, the recordings that we make are available on our YouTube channel for one month, and then we move them to our Patreon for a small fee. Um, so all of that said, here's what you can do to help us make sure that the space remains accessible. That's uh, mute your microphone when you're not speaking to help cut down on distractions and background noise. Um, share your pronouns by editing your name to include them. And again, if you need help with that, I'm not gonna go through the whole process, but you can message me or Pete or Gwen and we'll happily help you do that. Um, <clears throat> also give a content warning if what you're about to share might cause someone else discomfort. And then when the interpreter is present, which she is here, our dear friend, Megan, um, who does such a great job 
preparing and interpreting poems for us. Um, when she's here, turn off your camera unless you're speaking so that it's easier to focus on the interpreter and the reader. And then remember, again, this is your space to use respectfully as you need. Um, you're free to turn on your camera if you need attention, turn off your camera, use the chat function and make any requests. We'll do our best to meet those um, and then look for links to access copies in the chat and then finally we have a feedback form that we would be really grateful if anybody who uses these services would would fill that out because it helps us both understand how to serve you better and um, helps us understand just justify this for grants and things like that um, so thank you so much for being here those are my spiels, um, and I'm going to introduce our opening readers who, again, are going to read one poem each in rapid succession, um, and then we'll move into Aditi's reading. Um, so first, we're going to hear from our very own Gwendolyn Ann Hill, um, and then from Vasanta Sambumurti, and then Josh Lukenbach, Molly Sroges, Noelia Serna, Shannon McGill, and then John Miller. Um, and you can find all of those poems in the access copy, which Gwen has posted in the chat. And uh, with that said, Gwen, would you like to read us a poem? Yes, I will do that. And now I just have to figure some things out. We've, we've put Gwen in the awkward position of both reading something and um, managing all of the tech for this event at the same time. So when you have a chance, just like give Gwen a little clap. Ooh, that was so hard. I had to figure out how to spotlight myself. Okay, now I have to find my poem. Doo, doo, doo. <laughs> okay, so I picked this poem, uh, Elemental by Joanna Clink. <clears throat> I brought what I knew about the world to my daily life and it failed me. I brought senseless accidents and a depravity sprung inside the jaw. Also, I brought what I had learned of love, an air of swift entrance and exit, a belief in trouble and desire. It will amount to something, I was told, and I was told to hold fast to decency, to be spotlit and confident. I was told next year's words await another voice but you are a hard mouth to speak to. And if I write the list, it will be free of constancy. It will include fierce birds, false springs, a few oil lamps that need quickly to be lit. Also dusk and weeds and a sleep that permits utter oblivion from our stranded century. This is not a natural world. And if there are recoveries from confusion, they pass like rains. I don't look to the robins for solace, neither do I trust that to make an end is to make a beginning. If we are not capable of company, we can at least both touch the quartet inside evening, the snow inside the willow, the bewildering kinship of ice and sky. But as I walked, I saw crows ripping at shapes on the street, a square of sunlight, sunlit flare on the roof, Take my hand, if only here and not in the time that remains for us to spend together. We will stand and watch the most delicate weathers move second by second through the grim neighborhood. I will lean into you who have loved me in your way, knowing where you are and what you care for. Thank you, Gwen. I love when we have poems by other people um, be part of this. Um, I feel like it contributes to that feeling of, you know, that poetry is all one big community. Um, so thank you. Um, our next poem is by Vasanta Sambumurti. Vasanta. It's like this game I play where I put like the window in one corner and then the document in another. So I'm almost there. Okay. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much, Open Mouth People um, and Aditi for doing the reading and the workshop today. I also um, 
was struggling with some pieces lately and I've never heard of the N plus seven website. And that was like incredible. Also we're baking a pie, but <laughs> I, I was so excited to find out about that website. So um, I, I don't know, I'm just like really looking forward to using that. Uh, this poem is called Deific um, Woman. Candelabra lit, momentous, oil lamp, oil lamp, creme wax, cotton wick, tipped with hot earth velvet, like other shapes, prismed indefinite, cubic, shrined for our deity, our lady of scar language, sulfurous ancient, she who frightens, hand and tongue, red eyes, dark and endless, roomy saint, poetess, oral gaze crisp, seeing what is wished not, she is mother, father, every ancestor, tender, haunting manifest, mind speaker, stone teacher, our lady, the resistant, our lady, the lotus, our lady, the diarist, she who creates occasion to bless us, night song poultice, Urgus mantra, the music electric, she inscribes what burns, might burn for writing, no fear, ash is her making, she is the altar, we are the worshipers. Thanks so much. Yes. Um, our next poet is Josh Lukenbach. Hello, y'all. Am I making noise? You are. Okay, that's perfect. Um, this is called After the Quarantine Ends. I'll have you over to this modest duplex and cook a meal for us as you recline where we can sit together a while by the garden. Depending on the season, we can harvest collards or tomatoes or squash with which to make our feast. Of course, your friends should come along too. If there's no room on the porch, we can spread blankets on the grass, bring them or tell them they're welcome another time too. If it's winter, the crop's gone, the ground frozen and our breath lingers in the air, what a joyful occasion it will be still to share these indoors with you. I can at least give you a few seeds saved from last year's green beans, which grew from seeds a stranger I met saved, from those her kin saved every year since the Great Depression, passed down generations and gifted to passers-by on the road. Yes, of course, when you come, you must take a little handful, some for yourself, some to give away. Just think of all that food by now, tracing back to a thing so small, an abundance which, if we so choose, goes on and on forever. Sorry, I was too busy typing into the chat <laughs> to immediately say beautiful. I love, I love that um, connection of, of seeds. Um, okay, our next poet is Molly Strogis. Molly, you're muted. Ah, all right, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Yay. Uh, I, I remembered to turn my camera on and forgot to turn on my microphone. Uh, this is a poem I wrote called A Letter to My 12-Year-Old Self. And it's inspired by one of my favorite book series, which is The Circle of Magic by uh, Tamara Pierce. Dear Molly, I know you're going through a lot right now. You don't have a place you belong. All of your accomplishments at home are overshadowed by those of your siblings. You will never be fashionable or normal enough to be accepted at school. You can't even be yourself around your so-called friends. The last time you let your guard down around them, they sold your pudding cup to a random kid for a spare quarter. I'm sorry to say you will not easily forget this. Perhaps it is because even the adults in your life cannot figure out that it's not about the pudding cup. It's about the fact that there is literally no one in your life you can trust with your magic because you have magic. 
You can already feel it in you, bursting to come out. Your entire life is like living in an augmented reality with this other fantastical world overlaid on yours and no one else can see it. Well, you aren't the only one. Very soon, maybe even this year or the next, you will meet four kids like you. Four kids who are bursting with magic that no one can see. Magic so strong it feels sometimes like it might rip them apart at the seams. Maybe you have already seen them from afar. Maybe you have run across them in the bookstore and you can still hear their voices calling your name. If you have missed them, do not worry. They will find you. And they will guide your way to Winding Circle Temple. You will grow up with these mages and learn from them all your life. Again and again, they will confirm what you have always known, that magic is everywhere around you. And it is not taken or channeled or used, it is crafted. And if you can't find a place to belong, you can craft one. I won't lie and tell you the journey will be smooth after that, but they will help you. They will make you clothes to protect yourself and armor to get you through your battles. They will carry you through storms and guide you down a path filled with flowers. And you will learn how to weave words like spider webs. You will discover how to paint the skies of your earth a new color and build a VR screen that will finally let everyone else see what you have seen all along. And you will find so many other worlds in the process because the beauty of ambient magic is that it isn't obvious. You will find people with your gift and so many others hiding in plain sight. You will learn to spin your magic with theirs and you will at long last build a place where you belong, a family. And that family will feel so strong, it just might be able to withstand anything. Who's to say otherwise? Many of these people will be different from you. They may come from different countries or speak different languages. They will have interests you don't understand. They may be kings or beggars. Some of them you may not like at first. All of them are sure to hurt your feelings, just as you are sure to hurt theirs. But if you touch your magics together, none of these things will matter because it is the differences that will make your tapestry colorful and it is the mistakes that will make it unique. And because I know you have never had good balance and you may struggle to get up, I have come to give you these blessings. May you have Sandry's fiery sense of justice and Lark's unending patience. May you have Triss's steadfast willingness to learn and Nico's sense of all things magic. May you have Daja's grounded faith and Frostpine's joyous humor. May you have Briar's sense of wonder and Rosethorn's fierce love for all living things. And on that note, may you have Crane's dedication and Gorse's generosity. If you carry these blessings with you, then I promise that even when everything is at its darkest, you will find your light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, I should have mentioned before you read that also um, we're, we have a partnership with Ozark Poets and Writers Collective now. So Molly and Noelia Serna, who is our next reader, are both representatives of that other wonderful reading series here in Fayetteville. So Noelia, it's you. Hey, everybody. Um, so this is called Walking Our PTSD. The puppy is afraid of the trash truck, the way it clangs metal against metal against the darkness of the early morning. He is afraid of the electric box, disguised to look like a rock, the one that marks the halfway point of our walk down our street. He is afraid of recycling bin lids, disabled dachshunds, and the friendly dog that wags his tail and barks a greeting from his backyard. I feel him pull against his leash to cower behind my legs, but never lose my temper. Instead, I kneel down and blow kisses when he whimpers, hug him when he quivers. I too know what it is like to be afraid of things no one else can see. 
Sometimes trash trucks can look like monsters in the dark. Sometimes fake rocks can hide dangers only I can sense. Sometimes recycling bin lids can be holes in the sidewalk. I call him sweetheart and kiss his muzzle, knowing I am afraid of the sound of keys and closing doors, knowing like him, I am afraid of life's normalities. How I always wonder when someone tells me they are going to the store, how many times it will take before they don't come back anymore. The puppy is not the only one that spends his days staring out of windows, looking for the car that holds the one he loves to return. My recycling bin lids are the extended silences of a phone that does not ring. My fake rocks, the temporary goodbyes that feel like forever, and my trash trucks, the emptiness of cold sheets on the other side of the bed when I wake up alone in the middle of the night. I know what it is like to hear bombs lurking beneath the singing of birds, what it is like to hear the helicopters and blaring sirens despite the peacefulness of a normal Wednesday night. I kiss the puppy, tug gently on his leash, and tell him he's coming home with me. I tell him I love him and that I'm right here. I tell him we are going home. And a part of me wonders, as we finally continue our walk, if I am reassuring him or myself that someday someone will see the fear and instead of running will tell me we are going home, that I am loved, that they see the trauma, but are here to swim against the only stream I have ever known. So we walk. His tail begins to wag, thumping against my leg. I blink back tears as he gratefully leans against my leg and wish for a reassuring love like mine for him. We walk past the fake rock and the puppy walks past with his head held high, a sign that even the deepest fears can be soothed. Thank you so much, Noelia. You gotta love a dog poem. Um, our next poet is Shannon McGill. And I wanna invite everybody um, who's reading to put your social medias in the chat if you want people to follow you. Um, I'm sure lots of people here would be glad to be connected. Hey everybody. Um, before I start, I want to say how everyone did such an amazing job. I felt like I was listening to a Jack Johnson song in acapella when Bro read his. Um, just everybody's amazing. So mine is about me being butthurt over an email. Rejection. We appreciate your submission, but... Words and words and words, your submission was not chosen. I tear apart each sentence every other hour, just in case there's something I missed. A small clue between the appreciate and the rejection that says something, anything, except that I'm not chosen. It's worse than a breakup text. Say you like someone else, my best friend, your ex. Say you don't like me. Just don't start your message with, good afternoon. We appreciate your submission, but thank you. I don't know if you were watching the chat, Shannon, but um, <laughs> you got <a> to, <laughs> everybody feels that way. It's I don't so know hard. how to work the chat from my iPad. <laughs> Um, you got to hear for this relatable content, a 100%, some upward arrows agreeing and, uh, and, and a comment on that, but. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, I don't know if, if John ever joined us. John, are you here? I'm gonna say John didn't make it, um, which is sad. Um, if you wanna read John's poem, it's in the access document. Um, and it's, uh, John John also runs a small chat book press in Wuhan called um, Ozymanthus. Um, so he's a really interesting person. I suggest you check out his work. Um, since John is not here, um, I'm gonna just go ahead and 
move us over into Aditi's reading. If Aditi, are you are you close to ready? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So um, I'm just going to tell everybody that. Um, so first of all, there's information about um, Aditi in the chat, um, where you can find her on the internet places. Um, and uh, also just want to say real quick before I read you her bio that um, we've been planning this reading. It was one of the, the several readings that got unfortunately um, pushed on and on and on because of the pandemic. Um, and I'm really excited about it because we've been having this conversation for I think almost a year now trying to pick a date. Um, so I'm really glad that you're here at ET and just really excited to, to get to hear you read your work. Um, so thank you. Um, I also wanna just, while I'm saying thank yous, thank you um, to all of the opening readers and just a little interim thank you to Megan for the amazing interpreting work that she's doing. Um, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about Aditi. We'll um, ask her to read her poems and then we'll um, all say we love each other and good night. <clears throat> okay, so Aditi Machado is a poet, translator, and essayist. Her second book of poems, Emporium, received the James Laughlin Award and will appear, or, sorry, and is out now from Night Boat. Um, her other works include the poetry collection, Some Beheadings, also from Night Boat, a translation from the French of Farid Tali's uh, Prosopoia um, from Action Books, and several chat books, the most recent of which are a long poem called Rhapsody from Albion, and an essay titled The End, Ugly Duck Duckling Press, which is uh, out now also. Um, came out right at the same time, right, Aditi? Like right at the same time as Emporium? Yeah. Um, so um, Machado's work appears in journals like Lana Turner, Bolt, the Chicago Review, Western Humanities Review, and Jacket Two. She's a former poetry editor for Asymptote, and she works as an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati, one of my personal favorite cities. Um, thank you so much for being here, ZT. I'm so excited. Oh, I am. Okay, I thought I was muted, but I'm not. Thanks so much, Molly, uh, for that introduction. And yeah, I mean, it's I'm I'm glad we got to do this. And also, um, I don't know. I just I think I just had a sort of really nice day that was paced in a kind of beautiful way by having the workshop in the afternoon, and then uh, you know a few hours to do something else, and then come back to this. And school starting tomorrow, so I feel like this is just like a perfect way to start ease into that more sort of academic climate, which can be kind of crazy. Um, so uh, thank you also to everyone at um, Open Mouth and uh, especially to Megan. Um, it feels like having a translator. I mean, that's what you are. And I'm, uh, that's a whole other part of my life is uh, translation and translation advocacy. So. Uh, this is really um, special. Thank you to all the um, open mic readers. You all were wonderful. Um, okay. Yeah, I noticed some names. I recognize some names in the audience, a few translators in the audience. Um, Kaveh Basiri, I remember for sure. Okay, um, I don't. I don't have. I never have good transitions to reading my poems. So I'm just going to go ahead and read two poems from my new book, Emporium, which looks like this, and um, and then I'll read some new work. Um, since we talked about monastics in my workshop, I thought I'd read one of my monastic poems, and this is called Nation. Steady. Steady now. A sense is peeling out the surface areas. Observe here the fit expressions as germane as botanic. Here a faith in images still and moving. You observe nothing quite proves prosody, but people feel rhythm in their bodies. The body is pronounced body. And here a faith in materials I too cagily profess. And then the sense faints. Fold this. Steadily, you discover exteriors. Fold them. 
Continual and cheapened light of the electric kind suffuses most areas in which you remain. In some sense, you are reporting on a country. What do you observe? You observe observation, its obstacles, forms of envy, narrative growing out the landscape constrainedly, a seasonal negation inducing absence. A relation blooms in this landscape full of abuses. The people aren't errant, they're erratic. Terror takes them. The air is filled with amazing becomings, Marcasian butterflies, fold this. This is not a truth, but a way, a movement simply moving futures into fuchsias. Um, so this book of mine called Emporium, well, it's called Emporium because a good chunk of it is located in marketplaces and emporia and the sort of uh, lyric speaker slash subject is she's just kind of a merchant woman who's traveling on this uh, silk route. So she's a pretty busy lady doing a lot of kind of transacting on this uh, road. And there's just this one poem where she kind of, you know, she just sits down under a tree and uh, takes a kind of breather. Um, so this is a sitting under a tree looking at the leaves above poem called Meadow Interregnum. It is the skyward glance that begins, begins to look upon the wind chimes up on the tree. In the tree, medallions, jade medallions quivering correlatively. Color flashing into the feet commits a stirring effect upon the loins. This feels good. This feels so good that the back should rest and the legs one had too long been upon and sinking in the dun earth feels good on the ear. The ear shifting with the head hits the bicuspid grass. Now it is the bicuspid grass that begins the ear. Meaning downwardly corresponds its deep wet riot. The back bites the deep dun earth. You get shook about for the late few pennies, but it just feels so done good. So good to be given pause the eye and ear somewhere in tow, and somewhere the foot, the foot that came in a pair, goes one, then the other, the ear grovels in the mud, the knee twists toward the sky. Are these the postures? The cunt that lies among the reeds? Is this? Now it is the cunt that begins. Now it is the skyward glance that stumps thy canny lingual dream that instituted the lying under the tree. And is this the posture? Doubt has the surface to it, like the skin of milk, but on the sea, the sea that the plain eye and the plain ear observe from their heartland seam. Is this possible? from this body? Doubt has this pleasure to it, like the skin of milk, but on the sea, and now it is the song that is alveolar. Now it is the womb that wanders, a cloud. Now it shall rain. Are these the divisions? Feel these ribs, are these? Feeling has this question to it, like, the skin of milk, the ear falls to the ground and listens. Coral reef receive this, like the male of the species receive this. Okay, some newish poems. By newish, I mean, I've been working on these for two years, but I'm a very slow writer, so um, suddenly after two years, it's feeling like this is becoming a third manuscript for me. Um, I won't say much more other than uh, 
this is a kind of end of times poetry series, which seems very appropriate for the time that we're now in, except I started writing them before we quite got to this stage. I mean, at least it was before the pandemic. Um, so I don't know. Okay. Um, I'll say there's no title. I don't know if I put a title in the document that you have. Um, and I may or may not read all of them depending on time. I'm at, I'm about halfway through right now. Okay. Okay. New poems. It's Thursday and you're on Main Street. There's a band playing in the snow, losing its distinction. You film it, unused to the climate and the faces turning like leaves in a blue autumn. Maybe the, maybe the blizzard is a case of tinnitus. A speculative wind floats through your instruments. A coat flies open. A violin plays disaffected by the cold. Red ribbons, blood boats, anomalous feast of artifice. The weather reports itself to a wall that is a dead vertical left. You film less out of sorrow than out of deference for the nonce of this year music. It is a bomb. It is a cold day, plumb full of deaths. Yesterday, it was less cold, de facto blazing. You were visited by a pure circumcorneal green that hurt your eyes. Sometimes experience is phenomenal in its segues. Do you remember you were peeling a turnip? That was some vegetable colored sky toward which stupefied you grew. You became its bespoke leek. You were thinking something that the climate kept controlling toward excess. This is what it is like, you thought, listening to the assignations of trees. Meanwhile, you would not eat the turnip. Meanwhile, you sat on a tuffet. Meanwhile, you earned a degree handed to you from the relief helicopter in the turnip sky. The day before that, you were sent a tube you presumed for breathing. Had you bought it? You had so neutralized your systems of nostalgia, it was nigh impossible remembering anything, especially anything remembering resembling intention. You held it, gentian-like tube, sort of frilled at one end and fluty at the other. Maybe it was, after all, a flower, except odorless and plastic. You put it on your face. You opened a jar of acetone. You made a positive local escape. One afternoon, you made it to the beach. You made to it an invertebrate overture, lay down slug-like, slit belly, what gave. You were entering what then was called the universal, a bit pendulous. You felt a motion that wasn't negative, pulling you toward the ancient texts you had discovered floating in some sewage. They were from the heyday of psychology. You laughed at this. An animal filament flickered at the edge of sea. By sea, they had meant mind. You laughed at this. You observed frothing, something universal, stung your toes. Something universal at the edge you nip your toes in. Something universal, this way you become. As in, you discovered you were sovereign. You began to govern yourself by modes of wit. Once it had been written, sacred means saturated with being. You spoke that zone into obliteration, lying out of an abundance of caution in untimely grasses. You could have had visions. You could have had anything you wanted, 
by means of indiscretion increasingly pervade in those final years in which lyric was put before all, lyric T, lyric grant, lyric mass shooter, give yourself up, except you couldn't, not to the accountants, not to the heightened scrutability of the land, heights you'd fall off of. Then an opaque zone or darkness bled, Impossible to extract confessions when they're spilling already everywhere. Then bloodless darkness, dissent, trust nothing. The sun is president. Thank you. Amazing. The sun is president. Thank you, Aditi. Um, thank you so much for reading. Um, we're really grateful um, to have had everyone here tonight. Um, this is actually, I think, the just just so you know, Aditi, the the best turnout we've ever had for a reading in January. January is not the month in which people usually go to poetry readings. So, um, hell yeah. Um, I just want to say um, Aditi's books are also, I, I have them sitting right over there, um, just like really lovely to hold. Um, and also, you know, po poets, it's important to poets to have um, their books purchased. Um, so we're putting links to Aditi's books in the chat and we hope that this reading will encourage you to buy them. Um, and uh, we also want to just encourage, <laughs> I love that, Molly. Um, we also just, I, I want to encourage everybody to stay connected with each other. I noticed some people putting um, contact information in the chat. Um, we really are all, one of our main goals is to help people, you know, be woven together in this way through poems. So um, please do stay connected um, and uh, join us next month for a reading and workshop with Susie F. Garcia, um, who's um, a Little Rock, Arkansas poet um, and a wonderful poet. Um, and that'll be on Valentine's Day. So if you're feeling um, feeling the love or the loss of love, come come do poems. Um, yeah, and then, you know, stay connected with us too. Please reach out. Um, we've got our feedback form in the chat. Um, if you wanna be an opening reader in the future, fill out that form. We're really into Google Forms lately. Um, <laughs> they're just so convenient. Um, yeah, and that that's everything. Um, I want to say thank you again to Aditi, to all of our opening readers, um, to our interpreter, Megan, um, and to uh, Ozark Poets and Writers Collective for helping us out tonight.